Welcome back. So, today, we continue our journey in Java's object system. And we're gonna talk about a feature of Java objects that makes them much more useful to us, that allows us to establish relationships between them, um, which at first is kind of a nice way of avoiding duplication within uh, the programs that we write. But eventually, as we'll see, and we talked about polymorphism and interfaces and other things, has really powerful properties that aid us in our software development, right? And really, I think, reflects something about real-world entities. So, you know, again, objects in Java, Java's class, Java's classes, the ability in Java to create new types, is a capability that's designed around the idea of working with data. And when we think about things in the real world, we know that there are relationships between hi things, hierarchical relationships between things, and we're gonna start seeing today how to model those relationships using our Java classes so that the data we work with in our programs more uh, accurately reflects the relationships and the, you know, the relationships between the data that we um, uh, find in the real world. All right, so first though, let's talk a little bit about the midterm. So overall, I was pleased with the aggregate performance of the class on the midterm. Um, there are two, if you wanna look at a couple of the practice problems, I didn't release the problem that was just already from the homework, because you already had access to that problem, but two of the practice programming problems are available as part of the homework 125 practice problem set if you wanna go after them. Um, use them for practice for the future. Notice that these problems uh, appeared on the midterm in several different forms. So it's possible that you saw one that was slightly different than the one that is on the practice problem set. Okay. However, you know, when we look at the midterm, when I look at the midterm, I mean, um, what I see is the aggregate performance of the class. And I look at that and I say, okay, that's fine. But behind that are, you know, 800 individual stories and individual assessments. And so let me talk for a few minutes about how you should interpret your midterm score. Because the point of the midterm exam, the reason why it appears at this part of the semester, you know, you know, I have colleagues and I've talked to people here that are like, oh, you know, the right thing to do is to just wait till right after the drop deadline and then the class should get hard, right? That way you can fool people. Um, there's two problems with that. First of all, the drop deadline's really late uh, and then we wouldn't be able to do anything all semester. Um, the second problem is I don't wanna do that to you. I want you to do a little bit every day. Um, but it's possible that at this point in the semester, um, things just aren't going very well. And if that's the case, we wanna make sure that we flag that and do what we need to do to help you either recover or make a decision about what you wanna continue in the class this semester. All right, so I would primarily interpret your performance on the midterm as a function of how you did on the three programming problems. Multiple choice questions, you know, maybe those are a little bit tricky. You know, you might have missed one or two or, or maybe a few. Um, I think that's kind of okay. Um, if you missed a lot, Maybe we should talk about it, but the thing I would think has the most diagnostic power for you to make your own decision about whether or not you should continue in the class are the programming questions. There were three of them, so, so here's how to interpret this. You got them all? Good. We don't need to say anything else. Great job, you did nice work on the midterm. If you did two out of three, good. You know, I think that's okay, I think that's acceptable, um, but, Whatever you've been doing, keep doing it, because you're gonna have to keep doing it to keep succeeding in the class. So you're not, you know, you cleared the bar, you didn't clear it by like a mile. So, you know, again, just plan on, continuing on, keep it on, keep it on throughout the rest of the semester, and if you do, you're gonna be okay. Um, if you only got one, then something, my suggestion is, something about how you are preparing for exams in this class needs to change. Um, here's the other thing that's, that's hard about this, and this is why tomorrow, in lab, um, particularly if you know, you didn't get any of the questions right, or if you only got one right, I'm asking the lab TAs to come and, and talk with you and to go over your answers. Because, you know, I've already talked with several students and made some small mistakes. That's fine. You know, a little, little error here and there sometimes. There's some little misconceptions that we need to clean up. You know, whatever. Um, 
So looking at your code, which I can't do for all 800 of you, I will be happy to do it for anyone who wants to stop by my office hours at any point. Um, but the TAs will be able to do that with you individually tomorrow. So they'll be able to look at what you submitted and say, okay, you're really close, or you're way off. I think we have some serious misconceptions we need to clean up. So that's one of the things we're gonna do in lab tomorrow. Um, if you didn't get any of the programming questions right, you know, again, please approach a staff member or be ready to be approached tomorrow in lab. You know, we don't do this to call you out or make you feel bad about yourself. We want to help. A lot of resources in this class, we have a lot of staff, we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of really friendly people. I mean, you know, from my vantage point, you guys may not see, um, you know, how hard some of the course staff, particularly some of the CAs, are working to help you out, right? You might think, oh, well, it was nice that somebody was patient with me and helped me through the homework problem. You don't realize that while you're receiving some help on the homework problem, there are like 30 other students that are also receiving help from other CAs, some of which are rapidly scanning back and forth between multiple threads, guiding you in the right direction. Um, so again, we want to help you, we don't want to this isn't like something about shame. This is about um, acknowledging that um, we're concerned about your performance in the class and we want to help. That starts with looking at what you did and assessing kind of where you are conceptually in the class and maybe having a little bit of a conversation about what needs to change going forward. Right, that's what we're gonna do tomorrow in lab, one of the things. Okay, any questions at this point? It's kind of a, you know, I, I think, I suspect, you know, I don't have as much of a sense of the ebb and flow of, of college life from my perspective, but I feel like this is, you know, we're kind of in the thick of it right now, right? I mean, the beginning of the semester feels like a long time ago. Thanksgiving break feels like a long time from now. It's hot outside for some reason. You know, you probably have other midterms and other classes. Things are starting to get, you know, when you start off, particularly as a freshman, everything kind of starts pretty easy for a while, and then everything's getting more difficult at the same time. And so it's natural to feel a little bit overwhelmed. Um, any questions about midterm, MP stuff? Yeah. Are there, so the question was, are there any extra programming questions? Um, not that we curate, uh, but you can certainly um, look on the website. We have some guides to find other places to practice, and the CAs can uh, help you with that in the forum as well. Yeah. Um, you know, someone asked me this the other day, and I have to admit, if, if someone would find one of these, I would be really happy, but I think, unfortunately, strangely, CS125 seems to maintain one of the better sets of questions about object-oriented programming that I've been able to find online. There's a lot of, like, little leak code questions about algorithm design and stuff like that, but the kind of object-oriented stuff you're doing right now, there's just not a huge library of that. Like, we'd, we'd like to move forward in the future to the place where we have a lot more questions, we're just not there. Uh, these questions actually take a while to, to produce. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do I distinguish between compiler errors and runtime errors? I'll give a brief answer, but this would be a great question for the forum where we can answer a little bit more detail, right? So compiler errors are largely syntactic mistakes. The Java compiler is gonna catch things like your variables are named incorrectly, you've got syntax that's out of place, whatever, you know. Uh, runtime error is anything else. When we uh, give you a question that has a runtime error on a quiz, it's typically something that we expect you to see pretty clearly. Like, you know, classic things, null pointers, right? Or a null reference. Like, I have an object that's null and I try to dereference it, right? Uh, arrays that go out of bounds. If I have a loop that walks off the end of an array, another sort of classic example. Yeah, but, yeah, so that's a brief answer, but I can, I can try to give a more full answer on the, on the forum. It's a good question. Okay, so, let's launch back into where we left off, and this isn't entirely review, because I don't think I, really uh, drove this home on Friday, but let's, let's keep talking about static. So to review, last week we started talking about Java objects and how we can use them to create our own types within the language that allow us to model any kind of data by combining data and algorithms, by combining state and behavior. So a Java object both stores information and it can combine any number of different other objects or pro Java primitive types 
but it also provides functions that I can run, right, if I have an instance of that object. Static is a keyword that changes the semantics of either a variable or a method that's associated with the class. Yeah. Oh. Greg, it's doing it again. There we go. Okay. Sorry. How's that? Um, thank you. So, normally, when I declare, so, and, and this is, you know, one of the reasons we talk about static now is that you see it in some of our examples, and it's also a keyword that dramatically changes the behavior of a variable or a method, particularly of variables. So, you know, I, a after helping students over multiple semesters, particularly with kind of the next few weeks of homework problems, a very common mistake is to have marked a variable static when it shouldn't be, or to have not marked it static when it should have been marked static. All right, so let's look at an example here. So I have a course class that I'm creating, and down here on line two, I have something that looks normally like a variable, an instance variable declaration. I'm marking it public, it means that every, anybody can access it or modify it without having to use a setter or a getter. Uh, its type is int, its name is count, essential value of zero. But I've added this static keyword to it. And so if I remove the static keyword, every instance of a ca course object, every instance of the class course, every object of type course has its own count. And if I modify one, I don't modify the others. Once I put static on it, there is only one copy of count. It now belongs to the class itself. So I don't need to create an instance of course in order to access it. Instead, what I do is I can access it directly using the class name. So on line 12, this is now valid code. And this is, looks a little weird. It's dot notation, which we've seen before with object instances, with class instances. But here I'm using dot notation on the name of the actual class itself. So you'll notice that I have, I have not created an instance of course. You don't see the new keyword here at all. Never created a course object. Instead, what I did is I accessed the static variable using this terminology. So static variables are not particularly useful, I would argue. We're gonna show you how to use them. They're not that common. Much more common are static methods. So here's an example of a static method. Again, something that looks very similar to my normal method declaration in Java. On line three, I have a method called print name, takes no arguments, returns nothing, it's void. It's public, meaning anybody can use it. But I've marked it static. So now again, I can call this function without creating an instance of the class. This is pr the reason why we see static methods. So how many people have used the static method recently? How many people here have worked on MP1 recently? Okay, all of you, I suspect, many of you, have used the static method. Anybody know what it was? The syntax here is the name of the class, which is capitalized, dot, and then some function. You might have used this, it might have been wrong, it might have been right, yeah? Yeah, so that's a good one. That lat lengths utils class, the distance function, that's a static method. You call it by taking the name of the class. You never had to use new to create an instance of latlang uh, utils. You just use latlang utils dot method name. What else? It's another really, really common package that I've seen some of you using on the MP. That's, that's handy, yeah. Yeah, math.seal, math.abs, anybody using those functions? Yeah, so those are static methods. Math is a Java class. And in fact, math is a Java class that actually, as far as I know, you cannot instantiate. You can't create an instance of math. There's something deep about that that mathematicians would probably appreciate, right? But you, you just can't do it in Java. Instead, what it does is it provides a bunch of helper methods that are useful for doing things like computing absolute value, computing the ceiling function, whatever. And those are cases where it doesn't really make sense to create an object. What, what would that mean? What would my math, math object represent? So this is how Java uh, provides libraries that 
other programming languages might provide for you to use. You know, a library might be just a bunch of methods. If I want to provide something like that in Java, what I do is I create a class, and then I add a bunch of static methods to it. So you can now call those methods, they can be useful functions that you can reuse throughout your code, like the ceiling function, like the absolute value function. You guys could have wrote those functions, but you don't need to because you can just use the ones that are built into the math class. So this is a common, a common idea in Java, and a common way that we use static functions. All right, so again, static methods. Now, just one thing to point out here is that I can call a static method if I have an instance of that object. I don't lose access to those static methods. They still come along with every instance of the object. So for example, here, I've called print name on line nine using the syntax, which is name of class dot function. And I can do that because it's a static function. If it wasn't static, I couldn't do that. We'll, we'll get into a playground in a minute. We'll play around with this and show you how it works. But once I have an instance, of course, I can still call that function, and it will do the same thing. Hey, guys? Hello? Thanks. B believe it or not, I can actually hear you talking up here. Yeah. That's how this room works. Um, both a pro and a con. All right. I'm getting better at figuring out where the sound is coming from. All right, good. But you can also call them on instances. Now, the fact that you can, remember when we, when we talked about our instance methods, our instance methods had access to this special variable called this that referred to the instance of the class that was running the method. But because I can call these methods in Java without an instance of the class, they can't use this. There's no, there's not guaranteed to be an instance of the class that I can use when the method is running. So here's an example. And this is a little bit confusing. So let's walk through this, because you don't see this here, right? Okay. So on line two, I have a variable. Is this an instance variable or a class variable? Do you see the static keyword? It's an instance variable. So every instance, of course, has its own name. If I modify one, I don't modify the others. But until I create an instance, of course, I've got no name variable. Now, print name is a static function. So when it runs, it's not guaranteed that I'm actually gonna have a course instance. I might be able to, I might have called this directly on the course class. And so I cannot access this field. You could replace this with this dot name and I'd have the same problem. The problem is that name is an instance method. Sorry, name is an instance variable. And print name is a class method. And so class methods cannot access instance variables. Because there's not guaranteed to be an instance of the class that actually exists. So again, going back to the math class, you can't create an instance of the math class. So every time math.seal runs, there's no this. It has to do all its work based on its inputs. And sometimes that's very useful, right? Because again, math essentially includes a bunch of helper methods that don't really need an instance of an object to work. All right, so because there's only one static variable. So if I create a static variable, it's only one copy of that variable associated with the course, with the class. Every instance of that class shares that variable. And this can be useful. So, you know, here's an example of a potential use for a static variable. I told you they're not actually very useful, but here's an example of a case where maybe you can make an argument that this is actually useful. So. I've got a static variable that's of type count. I've got a static variable that's of type int named count. I initialize that to zero. And then what I'm doing here is I'm increasing the count, and now every, every instance of this course has access to this. The way I would make this more useful is I would have the constructor actually increment that variable. And so we can do that. We'll, we'll do that in a minute. All right, public and private work the same way on static methods and variables as they do on instance methods and variables. There's no difference there. Uh, the semantics are the same. Public, the variable can be read or written by anyone. Private can only be written by methods on a class. Same thing with public uh, and private for static methods. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. So the question is, if I take off the static variable, uh, the static on this count variable, does that change the semantics? And the answer is it does, in a big way. Well, let me, let me show you an example of that in a minute in the playground. This is one of the things that's tricky about static, particularly for variables. So if you throw static onto a variable, suddenly everything about that class is, is behavior is probably going to change. Static methods, you know, um, the, you know, you may get some errors because you can't answer, access instance variables, but static, you have to be very careful with when you apply to a variable. All right, so these work the same. Okay, so let's, let's do some examples here. Let's, okay, so let's, let's go back. Let me get one, let me just actually pull one of these out. Let me get the count, this guy. All right. Yeah, no, I want, I want this one. Okay, let's use this as a starting point, actually rather than this example, which we'll, we'll come back to. But I think it's, it's good to do this. Okay, Chuck Stiles is gonna be angry with me, so I'm gonna fix this. All right, good. So let's, let's review what's, what's, on this, what's on this playground. So I've got a static variable named count, then I have an instance method called print count. Now remember, an instance method can access a static variable. A static method can't access an instance variable. So let's try that. Just make sure that that works the way that we would think. So let's change this to be an instance variable and make this a static method. So now I get actually a pretty helpful message from the compiler that says non-static variable count cannot be referenced from a static context. So my function print count is static. And so it can't access any instance variable. If I tried this, it doesn't, you know, Essentially, this is the problem. I don't have an instance of the class. Okay, so let's go back. Let's make this, um, let's make this static, and let's make the count static. So if both of these are static, then I'm good. So now let's, let's do what I suggested before, which is that let's make this count variable reflect how many courses have been created in my program. So, you know, I might have a program that's managing, like, grades for a bunch of classes on campus or something like that. And, you know, when I add a course to my program that I'm going to store information about, I might want to be able to print, like, on the page, on the web page for the, for the program, like, here's how many courses are in the system. Something like that. Okay? So, how are we going to do that? Yeah, so what do I know is gonna run every time a new course is created? The constructor. Right now I don't have a constructor, so I have my empty argument constructor. So what I need to do is I need to, I need to add a constructor to my course, and all that's gonna do is increment the count. Okay? Now down here I'm going to actually um, get rid of this. All right? And now, let me actually make this a little bit more useful. Let's put this print len, let's put this print statement here, and then we'll do another one after we print both. Okay, so this is working how, how we thought, right? And, you know, if I write a loop here, we just create some courses. A bunch of courses, and now I'll Oh, it's mad at me. Uh, not used, how about that, there we go. Yeah, okay. So now I create two courses manually, and then I have a loop that creates a bunch of new course variables, and when I'm done, I print off, I can, I can print, I can call that static function using any instance of course, and I can actually also call it without using an instance of course. So I can just call it on the class itself. Okay, any questions about this before we go on? and have some fun with this example. All right, so let's do an experiment. I made one small change to this program. All right, so is there gonna be a compiler problem here? Is 
There is. So what's that problem going to be? Yeah. Yeah, so now every course object has its own count. The count is not attached to the class. It's now attached to the instance of the class. So if I run this, if I try to compile it, the compiler is gonna give me that error I saw before, okay? All right, well, let's say it's like late at night, I'm tired, and I'm just like, I'm just gonna make this work. All right, I'm gonna make it work by just changing this to be not static. Oh, now it's mad at me down here, so I've gotta change this to whatever. I'm just hacking, I'm trying to get stuff to work. Okay. So now, let me show you again, the, the power of static. This is, so I, if I put this here, it does what I want. If I take it off, it's no longer tracking the number of courses that have been created. The reason is that every course has its own count. And so when the constructor starts, the count always starts at zero. We can convince ourselves of that. Let's put a little logging in the constructor. Let's figure out what the count is when the constructor starts running. Okay? If I put static back here, now you'll see that the count is tracking the number of times the constructor is called. All right, so I've got a, pro I've got a problem with this piece of code that maybe you guys can help me fix. Here's the problem. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm working on the last part of CS125, this final project with my partner, and I don't really trust them, you know? Like, I feel like they might have, like, used all their homework drops or something. So, um, not sure I want them to, you know, so, so they might try something like this. Right? So what if, what if they mess up and they just modify the count directly? So now it's wrong. Right? Let me get rid of this. This is cluttering my output. Okay? So now my count is wrong because I've accessed it directly from the class. What can I do to fix this problem? There is something that I can do, yeah. Ah, make it private, indeed. Yep, indeed, this will work. Now it's gonna fail right now, because the compiler works, I can't access it. But, once I get rid of this, it's gonna work beautifully. Yeah, so here's an example of a case where using private improves the overall sort of safety of the code that I've written. Now it's, now it's less likely that someone's gonna make a mistake. Because the only person that can modify count is whoever can change the course, the code of the count class, right? Or sorry, the course class. You know, you have to modify the source code of course in order to change this variable. All right, questions about this? we go on. And, you know, if I, if I wanted to allow access to it, I could create setters and getters and things like that. Essentially what I have is a, a getter, right? Why don't we make this a little bit nicer? Let's create a public int get public static int get count return count and then let's, instead of printing this, what we'll do is we'll just say system, I'll get rid of this guy rid of this guy, I don't want to write, rewrite all these, and we can actually do course dot get count. So now, rather than having these w this sort of special print method, I'm actually, I've created a, a getter for my count variable. Essentially what I have is a read-only count variable, because there's no setter for it. I don't want anybody else to be able to change it. I'm changing it according to semantics that I've defined as part of how my class works. Okay, good. Question. So, you know, the, the, one of the reasons, I've, I've thought about this a bunch of times, I thought, eh, maybe we should talk about static. It's confusing. But, let me just give you a sense of what my strategy is. I think the confusion that occurs when you're forced to work with static a little bit is actually your brain starting to reckon with what Java objects actually mean. The fact that static causes something to be shared forces you to think about what parts of an object are shared versus not shared. 
when I create an object, every instance, when I create a class, every instance has certain properties that are its own, and other properties that it shares with other classes. So for example, let's extend this a little bit, and we'll create a public string name. And now, you know what, actually, let's make this private. Let's have our course constructor set the name. All right, so now I'm forced to add a name when I create courses. Let's make up some new courses here. PS 1 0. There you go. That'll work. Yeah. So every course has its own name. So if I do system.out now, because I made it private, I'm going to have to create a getter for it. So let's say public string get name, return name, and then let's print it. There we go. We created some new classes. Actually, 107 already exists, 101 already exists, 105 already exists, 108. Well, could be cool. I don't know what it's about, but anyway. But every course has its own name. But they're all sharing this count object. So again, this confusion, this, this sort of like having to hammer through this a little bit, I think will help solidify in your mind what Java objects really are and how classes store information. Okay, a couple of other things. You know, we're sort of doing Java keyword bingo at this point, so let's cross another one off of our card. Final. You guys have seen this a little bit when you've been working on MP1. So final is a modifier that I can add to a variable that indicates that its value cannot be changed, ever. So I initialize it once, and then it can't be changed later in my program. Now, final variables essentially allow us to establish symbolic constants in our programs. We can talk a little bit more on the forum about why this is useful. Um, if you've, how many people have been getting some magic number errors in your code? Okay, this is the correct way to work around those problems, is to establish what's called a symbolic constant. So now, instead of having to put eight into my code everywhere where I'm trying to make a calculation that's, um, dependent on, let's say I'm trying to write a program to help you make sure you get enough sleep or not, right? And I have a bunch of calculations that I'm trying to do to make sure you got enough sleep, and maybe how much sleep you should be getting, and the average over the week or whatever. Um, but I, the, the program needs to know how much are you supposed to get. So one option is to just stick the number eight all over my code. But then as somebody's reading it, they're like, why is this value eight here? as part of this calculation? Why is it the denominator in this, in this computation? If instead, what I do is I establish, again, a symbolic constant. So I do this by saying, using final. So everything else here you've already seen, this is a variable, this part looks like a variable declaration, this is a type int, this is the name, the name looks different, we'll talk about that in a second, this is the value. But now I'm saying this is static, there's only one copy of it, it's almost always true for final values, and public, anybody can read it. Now it's final, so they can't change it, and final. So the final indicates that it cannot be modified. I'll show you in a minute, if I try to modify a value that's final, uh, it won't work. The compiler will catch this and complain. The names of constants in Java have a different format than the variables that you're used to seeing. So normally, when we use variables, they start with a lowercase letter, and we use camel case. Constants, the convention is, they are all uppercase. Um, I think this is called, there's a name for this. It's snake case, but it's like, there's a special name for it because it's all capital. So snake case is used by languages like Python. It indicates that you break words using uh, underscores. And then the all capitals, I think Ben looked this up once. Maybe one of you guys can figure it out. So it's like angry snake case um, because they're all capital letters. The reason for this is because when you see something like this in your program, you know what it is. You know that this is a, the constant of some kind, right? Now if someone's reading your code and they see hours per night, they see, you know, amount you got minus hours per night, they see, oh, this is a computation that's trying to figure out if I got enough sleep, right? And it's using this variable. The other nice thing about symbolic constants is let's say that a year from now there's new research that comes out that says you should really be getting nine hours 
of sleep, or 10, or 6, or whatever. Then, instead of mucking through my code and trying to figure out every time when I used 8, was it actually the number of hours of sleep, or was I using it for something else? I just make this one change. So I can take my code, I can change hours per night to 9, or 7, or whatever the new uh, data indicates, um, rebuild my app, and it's good to go. Okay. So again, the compiler will enforce this for you, right? So once I've established that hours per night is eight, there is nothing that I can do to change it. The compiler will not allow me to modify it. Um, if I take that off, it's gonna complain about the other one. There's no way to change it. Okay, final. Static, final. Questions before we start talking about something else? Final is not particularly difficult to wrap your mind around, I don't think. Our homework problems this week are designed to give you practice with static. But again, you know, here's one way to solve some of these homework problems. Try it with static, and then try it without static, and see which one you get credit for. It's not particularly useful, right? Um, particularly when you think towards the future, and it's like, try it with static, try it without static, see which one crashes when I'm demoing it as part of my IPO, and my company loses billions of dollars in valuation, right? So I do want you to think about what's happening when you, when you apply these keywords in part of your code, right? Not just blindly make changes. Um, question. Ah, great question. So what does it mean to make a class final? I like this question, and I'm gonna briefly stop here because it's, it's a really, it, it's actually a really good question. Okay. Um, so let me create an empty class here called test. I'm gonna destroy this example, and I'm gonna say uh, test, test is equal to new test, which is pretty boring, right? I have an empty class. Ow. Oh, it's mad at me. There we go, okay. Now let's find out. Oh, okay, check that, I was mad. So wants me to put public final here. Okay, so that works. Um, anyone have any, anyone have any questions about what it means for, any, any clues about this, final? Yeah, so we'll, uh, this is a good segue into our next topic, right? Um, and so I'm gonna come back and we will talk about that again. Keep that in your mind. But the way I wanna introduce us to our next topic is to pose a conundrum. So how many of you, let me just ask you a general question. How many of you, as you've been working on one of our MPs, have encountered something, well this, hopefully this is all of you, that you didn't understand? Something that behaved in a way that you couldn't explain? Okay, good. So when you are, and your travels through the world of computer science, you will have moments when something does something that you don't quite get. It might behave in a way that you didn't understand, it might do something you didn't expect it to do. Now sometimes, the thing it's doing is something that you don't want to happen. And there it's like a bug and you just fix it, you move on with your life. But there's other times when there's something going on, there's something, this indicates that there's something about the world that you don't understand. So let me show you an example of something like that right here. Okay. So, I've got a public class example. Remember, our new examples work so that they all start in the static main method that's defined in the example class. But example's just still a class. So I can create a new instance of it, which I do on line four. And then on line five, what am I doing? Someone walk me through what that line of code does. So at this point, I have a variable called lowercase example. It's a type example. There's nothing interesting about it yet. I haven't created any, you know, instance variables or instance methods. I'm just getting started with this. But, well, let's try running this first. Okay. All right, ignore the output. The output is a red herring. What's confusing about this? What about this 
should challenge your idea of what we've been learning so far. Something's wrong with this. There's something that is, ha something we just did does not line up with what we've been discussing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I'm calling a function on this instance of the class. I've got an instance called example, all good. But I haven't created any instance methods or instance variables, so why can I use this dot notation here and call a function to string? There's no function to string. Do you see a function to string? I don't. So why does this work? There's a couple of other things I can put in here as well. Um, that will work. Um, the other ones are, I'm, I'm not gonna go into yet, okay? But this doesn't make sense, okay? Based on what I've told you, when I set up the class, it's a blueprint. It's supposed to define how the class works. And this example class has not told me what it means to call this two-string method. So why am I allowed to call it? And it seems to have, like, semantics. So, like, let's try passing a variable to it, okay? Now that doesn't work. And the error message is actually starting to give us some clues about what's happening. Okay. So the next big topic we're gonna start talking about today and continue on Wednesday is one of the fundamental organizing principles about how we set up classes in Java. Done right, this can really simplify your code and make it easier to understand and reason about. It's also something that reflects the nature of real world entities. And this idea is something called inheritance. So in Java, a class, can inherit behavior and state from another class, okay? I typically do this to set up relationships between classes that reflect things about the world, all right? So, here's an example. On the top, and you're not gonna all understand all of this yet, but in a couple days you will. On the top, I'm declaring a class called pet. It's kind of normally, this is pretty much what we've seen already, public class pet. I've got these two protected variables, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but these are essentially instance variables, a string name and a string type. And then I have an instance method called print me that essentially prints a formatted message with the name and the type to the console. Now on line nine, I have something new. So this is another place where we're introducing new terminology, new syntax that allows us to work more effectively with Java's class system, Java's object model. On line nine, I'm creating a new class called dog. So that part I understand, public class dog. So this is public, anybody can use it, it's a class. I'm setting up a new type in the language. Dog is my name, it's capitalized because I capitalize the name of classes. But what comes next is new. So I have a new keyword. You can see it's highlighted in purple like other keywords, extends, pet, okay, extends. This is how I establish an inheritance relationship in Java. So essentially, what does this mean? So it means that dog wants to inherit state and behavior from pet. When I say I'm gonna extend another class, what I'm saying is I'm gonna use that other class's blueprint as a starting point for my class. And then I might wanna add some stuff to it. Or I might want to establish, you know, certain semantics about how it works. So my dog class right now doesn't actually add any variables to pet. But it does provide a constructor uh, that sets the type of the pet properly for this type of pet, okay? So the other thing that I can do, now I do inherit the name and the type from the pet class. So you'll see here in my constructor, I'm setting the name and the type. I have not declared these as instance variables as part of my class. The reason I can use them is they're declared as part of pet and I've declared that my class dog extends pet. I also inherit any public or protected behaviors from pet. So for example, the print me function. Print me was defined by pet. But if I have an instance of a dog, I can call that method. I've inherited the state and behavior from my parent. All right, so let's establish some terminology quickly before we're, we run out of time today. So in Java, I create an I establish inheritance relationship using this extends keyword. So when I declare my class, 
I am allowed to declare that it extends one class, one, at most one. This is different than other languages. There are other languages that support multiple inheritance, Java does not, okay? One class. When you extend a class, you inherit its public state and behavior. So any public or protected instance variables, you have access to those. Any public or protected methods, you have access to those. Private stuff, no. So we'll come back and, and, and flesh this out more. Here what I've done is I've created two classes that inherit from pet. So a dog is one kind of pet, and a cat is another kind of pet. Now, you might quibble with me and you might say, well, a dog is really actually a species of wild cre of creature. Some dogs are pets and some dogs are not pets. There are definitely wild dogs out there that you would not want as a pet. Um, same thing with cats, right? Some cats are pets. I'm not sure that, well, anyway, you can, pe people disagree about whether or not you ever want a cat as a pet. Um, but there are some cats that some people think make nice pets, and then there are some other cats that clearly do not make good pets. Um, but anyway, but this is how we're gonna model things. This might be an app that we're using to, you know, help, you know, set up uh, care for people's pets, right? There's a couple of startups that are trying to do this today. Once we establish inheritance relationships between classes, we have some terminology that we use. So we call pet the parent of dog and cat, and we sometimes call dog and cat pets children, okay? I can establish multiple levels of inheritance in Java. Next time, I think this later this week, we'll look at a tree, a data structure, a visualization that allows us to see this a little bit more clearly. But here I have a case where I, dog extends pet, and then mutt extends dog. So mutt is a type of a dog, which is a type of a pet. Mutt inherits dog's behavior and state, Dog inherits pet's behavior and state, and this relationship is transitive. So mutt inherits behavior and state from pet, through dog, okay? Right? Um, sometimes we refer to dog and pet as mutt's ancestors, and we would refer to dog and mutt as pet's descendants. So these are just termin these terminologies are drawn from family trees, right? Um, okay. Where am I? I think I'm, I think I'm almost out of time. I think I'll come back and do protected next time. Okay. Well, actually, you know what? I have a, I have a, I have a minute here. So I've, I've started to put protected on the slides. What is the, what is the intention behind protected? The goal behind protected is to allow access to a, a variable or to a method to be determined by this inheritance relationship. So public, anybody can read or write the variable. Private, only methods defined on that class. Protected, the variable can be read or written by any descendant of that class. Any methods on that class or any methods on classes that descend from that class. Now protected is actually a little bit more complicated than that. I'll finish up with this on Wednesday and we'll continue to talk about inheritance. All right, so. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, there is no coders chapter on this week's quiz. Chapter four for next week. I'm so confused by that. Easier than the questions that it's replacing. All right, the auto grader is working again. Use that to check your scores on MP1. I would have appreciated a round of applause for the auto grader. Got it for coding. See you guys on Wednesday.